Good, well, it's roasting in here anyway, so... Uh, okay, Revolution, uh, what's it all about? There's a repeater down there, excellent. So it's to accelerate the, the development of new technologies, ultra-low carbon technologies, and develop the supply base. Um, developing the supply base, there's been a lot of talk about this earlier in the presentation. Uh, we're actually a very, very demanding customer. We're not nice to deal with, um, as some people would say. Um, and why would we bother to work with a small and medium enterprise company? Because it's much easier for us to actually work with one of our tier ones. We've got an established relationship with them, built up over many years, and, uh, uh, and yeah, we don't really want the pain of having to, to manage the supply chain down at a detailed level, which although it's fantastic for an engineer to do it, is not actually part of our business. So doing something like Revolution allows you to work at that detailed level because it attracts a level of funding, because some unusual suppliers come into it, it gives you that sort of, that, that edge and allows us to sort of um, steep some of the suppliers in what we expect from the sort of the whole supply chain management uh, point of view. Project structure, we were the leader of the project, Jaguar Land Rover, and we work closely with Axion, who are based up in Dundee. Uh, and uh, our output from the project was the XJE project, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, the other partners were Lotus, uh, Lotus and Nissan, Nissan through their uh, Cranfield uh, uh, activity, and Evo Electric and X-Track. Uh, Evo Electric are a motor supplier who are quite so closely associated now with GKN, an X-Track. Um, anyone who's uh, had anything to do with racing or Formula One, they make beautifully engineered, meticulously designed uh, transmissions and gear, gearboxes. Um, a very, very interesting high-tech company, but very much in that sort of Formula One niche and, and motorsport niche. What the pro project successfully delivered is it's developed some suppliers towards uh, uh, Tier 1, and it's delivered some low carbon, some ultra-low carbon vehicles. It's delivered the XJ uh, e, although we're not quite finished yet, and I'll go into exactly where we are later on, and some range extended electric, uh, uh, electric, vehicles, electric vehicles with an internal combustion range extender uh, built, into the, uh, built into the vehicle to give you a greater breadth of capability from that, uh, that particular vehicle. So XJE, based on our lightweight uh, XJ platform, uh, the target was uh, better than 75 grams per, uh, uh, per uh, kilometer. Next slide shows the targets. Uh, six and a half seconds, not to, uh, uh, roughly not, not to 100 kph, but not to 60 in those of you who are going metric inch by inch like me. Maximum speed, 155 miles an hour. Uh, an electric vehicle range, so a, mo a, a, a range in electric mode of 25 miles, and I'll go into why that is in a little while. Um, but I think one of the things to take out of this slide is what we're looking at is a full capability vehicle, no compromises. I said our customers are demanding. They're not going to accept something that, that won't fulfill the full breadth of capability, the luxury, the, 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 the vehicles that they expect. We can't compromise. Right, plug-in hybrids. Um, for those of you who are non-technical in the audience, a plug-in hybrid, uh, a hybrid system uh, allows you to r basically run a vehicle more efficiently. What it does is it captures energy when you slow down, and, uh, and the electrical system on the vehicle allows you to reuse that energy when you speed up. So it's, if you like, it's recycling energy on the vehicle, on that system local to the vehicle, it's recycling energy. If you add a slightly larger motor and a slightly larger battery, what you can do is you can add electric range. Now this particular plot here, I've taken it from a UK travel study, what it shows that you can, you can cover about 95% of UK journeys with a range of 25 miles. So if you can persuade the customer to plug his vehicle in and drive electrically for those short distances, then what you've done is, you, is you've transferred the, um, uh, the CO2 problem to the power station. 
and the power stations, the, the electricity grid is going through a massive, stage, uh, a massive exercise of decarbonisation at the moment, so we'll have lots of low carbon electricity in the future. So what that gives you is a low carbon way of doing your uh, short journeys, but still maintains the, um, uh, the full capability of the vehicle. So you have something from a customer point of view, it will deliver what he expects. It will deliver short range um, under electric low carbon, power, uh, low carbon power when he needs it, and it will also deliver full capability when he also needs that. Where are we on the project? Um, the slide builds up slowly. That's where we are, uh, between milestone three and milestone four means nothing to you. But what that means is that the vehicles are built, we're driving them around with engineers. We're just getting close to the point where we uh, track release them. Um, track release, a lot of people can, were confused by this. What this means is that we can actually allow non-engineering people to drive these vehicles in a track-based environment, in a controlled environment. And you have to think about how you engineer these uh, these vehicles. You get into your car, you press the accelerator, it accelerates, you press the brake, it slows down. You just expect that to happen. You don't expect any unusual events. Now if you think about, you've got an electric propulsion system in there and an internal combustion engine uh, uh, propulsion system in there, and you've got to manage between those two, you've got a pretty complicated control system. The sort of things that engineers love to play with. but that's got a challenge to it because you've got to transition between those different modes in an absolutely safe and seamless way. So that takes a lot of engineering, a lot of verification and validation as you go through, and it also takes some redundant systems in there. And one of the things that we do is we monitor the torque, so we have a, an overarching safety system that monitors what the driver's requesting, looks at what's coming out of the wheels, makes sure that's what's actually happening, and manages that. So, August 2012, to the end of this month, we'll have it to ready for track, and uh, towards the end of the year, we'll release it for road use. And uh, those of you who want to take a closer look and perhaps drive it, come to Low Carbon Vehicles 2012. Robert, I don't know if you can remind me of the date of that, I forgot. The 5th and 6th of September at uh, Millbrook, and you can drive the vehicle and, uh, and uh, experience it. So that's a summary of uh, the, uh, the various bits on the system, uh, the, the various parts of the propulsion system. So we've replaced the five litre V8 with a downsized engine, so a two litre GTDI engine. We've put in a, uh, a typical hybrid, it's probably got something like 30 or 40 kilowatts, so we've upped the power of the electric machine to, uh, uh, to nearly 70 kilowatts. We've got an eight speed transmission, we've got a lithium ion battery, which is mounted in the boot, and I'll show you a picture of that later on. Uh, RAEHB, that's a, that's a system that allows you to regenerate energy into the, uh, uh, into the battery. So you press the brake, and you're not necessarily actually moving the brake pads against the discs when you're pressing that brake pedal. What's happening is you're, you're operating the motor in a particular mode that pushes energy back into the battery. Because you're not running the engine all the time, you have to drive the air conditioning system uh, electrically. And uh, because you may not necessarily have a nice hot engine there to give you heat in the winter, then you have to have heaters, electric heaters, uh, on the vehicle to allow it to get warm in the winter. There you go. Those are, that's for the uh, technology uh, people among us. That's a line diagram of the various bits on the vehicle. So if you work from the front of that vehicle, you can see the four-cylinder engine, the uh, CIMG, which is that yellow bit in the middle, which is crankshaft integrated motor generator. Uh, those two uh, lined, uh, lines there are clutches, which allow you to uh, uh, disconnect and reconnect the, the engine and the electric motor in any configuration you want. The 12-volt system, which still has to be maintained for the lights and all the things that you don't want to run at very high voltage. Um, uh, the... Uh, engine control module, and the, uh, uh, the vehicle supervisory control, the thing that controls the hybrid, is actually embedded inside the engine management system. So it's, it's, it's interleaved with the, uh, uh, the complex control systems on the vehicle already. 
uh, transmission control modules, uh, the, 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 the battery pack. So quite a sort of a, um, a complex system when you draw it out in a line diagram. Gets even more interesting when you put it on the vehicle. And those of you who've been lucky enough to see our virtual reality um, uh, set up at, uh, at uh, the gate site, you can actually stand and look at all these components in the, uh, the vehicle. And it's such a major tear up to the vehicle to put all these things in. You just can't imagine the sort of the superimposition of all these things in the vehicle. It's really hard to do. And uh, uh, the uh, um, the, the things you have to compromise are things like some of your boot space. Um, you have to put in cooling systems. There are three or four com cooling systems on this. Um, you know, a very, very complicated system and a challenge not just for, for the electronics and control engineers, but also for the packaging engineers. So, concluding on that, it's a very important collaborative project. It's brought together some really good and some really interesting suppliers. We've learned a lot from it just from the... Uh, um, you know, just from the point of view of trying to integrate all these systems together. Without Technology Strategy Board funding, it just wouldn't have happened. We wouldn't have got this team together and it, we wouldn't have formed this consortium. And I think that's one of the key messages out of this, that that level of TSP funding is very, very important to bring together the right partners to foster these sorts of collaborations and do this sort of, uh, do this sort of engineering. That's it for me. I hope there'll be some questions later on.